God, we love to declare what you have declared, that it's finished. God, you have made a way for us. And so tonight, we just step into that to again marvel at the wonder of your love displayed on the cross. God, as we open up the scriptures, would you speak? Um, God, as we contemplate again your love, Holy Spirit, would you just draw us again um, into your presence, God? We welcome you in this place. Not that you're not already here, but would you awaken our hearts to see you? We are eyes to see you and our ears to hear you. And we recognize the gravity of what you've done on Good Friday. And we thank you. Our hearts well up with praise and worship and thanksgiving for who you are and what you've accomplished, for reconciling the world to yourself. We love you and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. <laughs> It is finished. Amen. You can jump ahead in your Bibles if you want to Romans 5. Um, We are staying tonight in this little mini series that we've been in from garden to grave, from grave to garden. And we're looking at the story of God redeeming humanity out from the grave, and back into the garden of his presence. Sin has led us to the grave, both spiritually, physically, and relationally. And Jesus rescues us out of the grave. And last week, Pastor Nate ended with a reminder that this is Holy Week. And Good Friday, we remember that Christ bore our sins, And that through his sacrifice, we would bear much fruit. So we celebrate on Good Friday. But how? How does the act of Jesus on the cross accomplish this? And why a cross? What an extremely odd symbol for Christians that represents salvation. This is a Roman execution device. It was created and perfected to squelch would-be revolutionaries with a horrifying death. Why would they do that? They wanted to show off Rome's might. This is how Rome acquired what's called Pax Romana. Does anybody know what that means? The peace of Rome. This is how Rome would accomplish the peace of Rome. Roman peace was accomplished by killing anybody who opposed them. Roman peace came at the edge of a sword. It was peaceful as long as you didn't oppose them. And so how is it possible that early Christians saw the crucifixion of their Messiah as good news? Well, through faith. And what happens three days later, they look back on the events of Good Friday and they see what is actually happening is that is God through Christ reconciling the world to himself. This is both a gruesome image and at the same time, it's a awe-filled image. It is ugly and it is beautiful, paradoxically. We marvel at the mystery that is the cross. Here's my point for the night. The ugliness of the cross is found in human sin. But the beauty of the cross is found in divine forgiveness. So we'll talk about the ugliness of the cross, that it's found in human sin. Like the song we sang, it was my sin that held him there. Our sin, that word in the Bible is a Greek word that means to miss the mark. And if you dive deeper into that word, it means two different words, to not be a part of or to not be together with. 
Sin means to not be a part of what we're supposed to be together with. And you can see how this word gets woven into an archery term, to miss the mark, because the arrow is supposed to be together with the target. But we miss in our sin, and sin separates people. It divides groups. It fractures our own mind, because ultimately... It grows out of a place of in our sin being separated, where you've separated ourselves from God. And on the cross, our individual, collective, and systematic sin is absorbed in Christ, the innocent man that bears the sins of the world on his shoulders. The ugliness of the cross is found in human sin, but... The beauty of the cross is found in divine forgiveness. Like Nick said last week, Jesus, our hero, shows us what God is really like. What is God like? Jesus shows us what God is like. John says that Jesus is the word become flesh. Jesus is the explicit declaration of God's will. Jesus is God's will in action. Hebrews 1, 3 says this, Jesus is the one and only perfect revelation of God's true nature. Amen? Jesus is the visibility of God. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And so he is God's central message of love to us. Romans 5, if you go down your Bibles, verse 6 through 8. It says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates, he shows his love through Jesus. And it's through Jesus, especially his death and how he dies, that God demonstrates his love. God plants a moment in history. God plants a moment in history. It's a focal point of clarity that forever demonstrates the incredible love of God. This is our focal point. The crucifixion of Christ exists as an ongoing demonstration of God's continued forgiveness. Roman soldiers nail him to a tree and God forgives them. Religious leaders hurl insults at him and God forgives them. His disciples betray him, abandon him, and God in Christ forgives them. The beauty of the cross is found in divine forgiveness. And it's that pursuing forgiveness of God that I just want to contemplate tonight. There's many things we can contemplate on the cross. We could do that forever. But tonight I want to contemplate on the forgiveness of God. And I want to share share with you a picture of that. It's a picture of something that summarizes the good news. It's called the gospel in chairs. Um, I first saw it from a Canadian pastor named Bruxy Cavey, and it, it stuck with me. Um, something that had an impact on me. And I want to share it with you tonight as we contemplate the forgiving nature of God that Jesus reveals when he says from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the story of God's love, but I'm going to do it in two different ways, two different versions. One's something we're going to be really familiar with, And the other is just going to dive into a contemplation of God's forgiveness in that. So this is the gospel in chairs. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created mankind in his image and likeness. And a God who is love wanted nothing more than to have a face-to-face relationship with his creation. But to have relationship, there must be love, and there must be love. If love is true, it must have a real choice. And so God gives humanity a choice to stay in relationship with God or to turn away from relationship with God. And humanity 
mistrusts God, listens to the serpent, and in sin turns away from God. And in Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and generation after generation, this is where we find ourselves. For our sin is separate ourselves from God. And God, who is holy and just, is also a wrathful judge and too pure to look on sin. So God condemns humanity by turning his face away. And we have a fractured relationship with God. But God is not just a judge. He's a loving father. And he sends Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, to redeem humanity, to take and bear the sins of the world, to die on the cross, to be raised again on the third day, to restore humanity back in relationship with God and restore God back in relationship with humans so we can live in the peace of God by his mercy. Version one. This is good. I want to dive into the forgiveness of God in this next version, though. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created mankind in his image and likeness. And a God who is love wanted nothing more than to have a face-to-face relationship with his creation. But in order to have relationship, you have to have love. And love requires choice to be real and true. So God gave humanity the very real choice to stay in connection and relationship with God or to move outside of connection and relationship with God. And humanity chose to mistrust God and his goodness and to trust the serpent's message and in so doing, sinned against God. And from gen and generation, we've been here. But God, who is holy and righteous, pursues Adam in the garden. And what does he say to Adam? Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? And in their curse and in their consequence of their sin, God even says, I will send a seed through you one day that will crush Satan, sin, and death. And he plants the gospel in the very third chapter of the Bible. Well, Adam and Eve have a seed, two of them actually, Cain and Abel. And Cain is jealous of his brother Abel's relationship with God. And God comes to Cain and says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. You must master it. But Cain disobeys God, and what does he do? He kills his brother, Abel. And what does God do? God pursues Cain. He says, Cain, where's your brother? What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out from the ground, actually puts a mark on Cain so that Cain will not be killed by others. And Cain's legacy continues in generation and generation and generation, humanity turning from God. But God finally comes to humanity, to Abraham, and says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a promise that from your seed will come a people that bless the world, that show what I'm like. And that promise comes true. And Abraham has sons and sons, and they become the Israelites. And they find themselves in Egypt and God, as slaves, and God redeems them from Egypt. He liberates them from Egypt, and he takes this people to Mount Sinai, where they get the Ten Commandments. And God is going to make a covenant relationship with his people, but what does Israel do? I want to worship the golden calf. And what's the response of God? Honestly, through some convincing of Moses here. He comes and he meets with his people again. He says, I will give you a covenant law so that you can stay in covenant relationship with me so we can know where we stand. And they say, okay. But then later they say, we want a king. And God goes, you don't want a king. But they say we do anyway. So God gives them a king. 
and teaches them through one of their kings, King David, what it's like to be a man after God's own heart. And in fact, says, from the line of kings that you shouldn't even have, I'm going to bring the Messiah through it. But the people keep turning away from the covenant relationship with God. God pursues them and sends them prophets. And what do the people do? They kill the prophets. And God pursues them still. But this time through exile. Not just to punish them, but to return them back to covenant relation. And finally, because of his love, God sends himself. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what we celebrate at Advent every year. Here is Jesus, fully God, fully human, who not only loves and expresses the love of God, but teaches us how to love God, teaches us how to love our neighbor as ourselves, even our enemy who's made in the image of God. He inaugurates the kingdom of God. And here's a woman who's caught in adultery, the act of adultery, and she's brought into God. And many men with stones ready to stone her. And they're testing Jesus. And Jesus says to them, he who is without sin, you can throw that first stone. And I love this line starting with the oldest verse because they get it. They drop their stones and they leave. And Jesus says to her, woman, where are your accusers? She's got they're nowhere. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There's a man who is an enemy of Israel. He's a traitor. He's a tax collector. And he is squeezing out the life of his countrymen for the occupying power that is Rome. How would you feel about that? He is hated. And what does God do in Christ? He says, Zacchaeus, you wee little man. I don't think he said that, but come down from the tree. Tonight I will dine with you. And Zacchaeus, in response to the radical grace of Jesus, repents, restores all that he stole. And Jesus says, salvations come to this house today. One of Jesus' favorite parables was about a father who had two sons, and the younger son said, Father, I want my share of the inheritance, saying, I wish you were dead. And he turns from his father, and he goes and he spends it on what the Bible says is lavish living. And like these stories always go, he finds himself at the bottom and broken. And he thinks to himself, man, my father's servants have it better than I have it. I will grovel back to God. Maybe he'll make me a servant again. If anything, just a servant. And Jesus tells the story of the father who, while his son was still far off, runs to his son, embraces him and kisses him, puts a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, sandals on his feet, and he throws him a party. But the story is really not about this son. The story is actually about the other son, who hears about his brother coming back and hears about the radical grace of his father and says, you know what? I'm not going into the party. And what does God do? He pursues the older son and says, everything I have is yours. Come into my joy. Your, your brother was dead and he's alive. Here is the savior of the world. God in the flesh. And on Good Friday, what happens to him? We say, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And on the cross, there's the wrath of our sin. 
The ugliness of the cross is found in human sin. The beauty of the cross is found in divine forgiveness. What does God say as he's being crucified? He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This is why we call it Good Friday. It's radical forgiveness. Undeserved forgiveness. It's not sappy or quick or cheap forgiveness. It's costly. It's not forgiveness. It's not love because we're wonderful. <laughs> it's love because that's just who God is. Love, period. It's this deep love that doesn't wait to find us worthy to be loved, but his love is what actually transforms us. His love is what actually breaks the power of sin in our life. His love is what takes us out of the grave, back into the garden. It's love that breaks the pattern of sin and evil in our lives and in humanities. This is grace, undeserved favor. And Titus 2, 11, 14 says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, and that gra it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives of the present age. On Good Friday, we find God and Christ absorbing the sin of the world and responding with forgiveness. The cross is where God received the most vicious blow of human sin, and what does he do? He does what he teaches. He turns the other cheek and forgives. The Apostle Paul tells us, like we read at the beginning of tonight, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. May we not confuse that God was reconciling himself to the world. It was us that needed to be reconciled. It was our vantage point. We yelled, crucify him. Jesus declared, forgive them. And even when humanity runs into the grave, where does God go? On Good Friday. He goes there too. The Son of Man enters into Hades. Jesus died for our sin and our salvation. Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Our sin needed to be taken away so that we could be forgiven and cleansed from our sin. And in dying on the cross, Jesus becomes like a holy vortex that draws into himself the sin of the world dying for our sins, and taking those sins where? Into the grave and leaving them there. Amen? His death removes our sin and breaks us from the enslavement of it. Nate shared this last Sunday. John 12, 24 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The cross, the cross, why a cross? It is Christianity's symbol because there, sins are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven on the cross. It is our symbol because there, the world is made right. When everything in us says, take, take, God says, now forgive. Forgive them. This is our symbol because this is where God is fully revealed. This is what God is like. If in the garden it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where humanity contracted death and sin, then it's the tree of Calvary where humanity finds its cure. It's in the forgiveness and love of God that humanity finds its cure. This is the radical, pursuing, self-giving, co-suffering love of Jesus, of God, displayed on a cross. So I don't know where that finds you. But like the song declared, it is finished. 
And on Good Friday, we remember the forgiving nature of our God, that though our sin held him there, he forgives. And what does that do to you? If it does it to me, it breaks that power of sin in my life because I'm coming from a place of forgiveness. And I'm amazed and I'm thankful. And like Titus 2 says, it makes me want to walk out and say no to ungodliness because his grace teaches me to do so. See, behold the man upon the cross. Behold him. Contemplate it. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. But his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection, what should we gain from his reward? I can't give an answer. But this I know with all my heart that his wounds have paid my ransom. On Good Friday, we pause. We contemplate the cross of Christ. We don't push into Sunday yet. We stay here. But we ask ourselves, what does this mean? What does this mean? May you rest in the words of Christ that it is finished. See your sins where they stay in the grave. And on Sunday when we celebrate, they stay there. Don't pick them up again. And may a thankful heart of praise and worship well up within you. For when we contemplate the, Christ, the cross, we see, yes, the ugliness of our sin, but we see the beauty of divine forgiveness. Tonight on Good Friday, we like to take communion to remember that, to remember the new covenant that we are in, to remember the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ shed for us, and to thank God it's an act of thanksgiving, of remembering him. And so tonight, as, we, as the worship team comes up and we respond, I want to invite you to go into a time where you contemplate the cross. There's probably a little more people than we expected tonight, so you don't need to rush. Don't need to rush. But we have tables in the back, in the sides, and in the front, and the same on this side. There's six tables. And unlike we normally do it where you come up and you grab the bread and the cup, you're just going to find two people standing there. And when you come up to them, one will have a loaf of bread, and you will take, and you will rip a piece off of that loaf, and they will say to you, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And you will take that bread, and you will dip it in the cup, and that person will say to you, this is his blood shed for you. And we do this in remembrance of the goodness of God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you um, for simply who you are. Your nature is forgiveness, and we see that in Jesus declaring that from the cross. 
we see that from what happens three days later. And so God, we simply pause tonight in the wonder of that. We marvel in the mystery that on the cross, though we see the ugliness of our sin, we also see the beauty of your forgiveness. And so God, we just simply believe that, live into that, and thank you for that. God, may we leave and may we worship, may we take communion, um, knowing that that is your disposition towards us, which is love. Your disposition towards us is forgiveness. Holy Spirit, teach us to stop running away from that in sin. Teach us to turn around and to see the God that you have always been. Jesus, we thank you for revealing the Father. Holy Spirit, we thank you for sealing that in our hearts. And as we worship tonight and take communion, would you move? Would you speak? If there's lies that need to be broken tonight, would you break them? Um, God, tonight, would you move in a way that heals hearts, that heals bodies? God, as we worship, may we remember your great love for us. So God, this is Good Friday because you are good. You always have been. You always will be. And we see that in you, Jesus. So God, we take your bread and cup and we remember your body broken for us. We remember and proclaim your death on the cross. We love you. In your name we pray.